Hey, good morning, everyone. It is a great day to come together to worship our Lord and Savior. My name is Jeff Vanderbilt, and I'm the online venue pastor and ministry director here at the Foundry. And I'm so excited that you decided to join us for worship this morning. Um, if you would like to stay connected with what's happening at the Foundry Church, um, you can text the keyword at Foundry Online to 94000 and press the number one key. That will just be a way for you to get updates and just stay in tune with what's happening here at our church. A couple other announcements to share with you this morning. Um, we are continuing to work through our Foundry devotional, our wisdom devotional. Uh, it's 365 days worth of daily devotions and it contains the whole book of Proverbs and will encourage and challenge you in your faith. And as we continue to make our way through um, this series called Intersections, we have this pamphlet that we put together for you. And it contains scripture passages that will take you deeper into what the pastor will be talking about on Sunday. So if you would like to pick up either of these, you can come anytime. The West Doors in the airlock, you'll find a hard copy of both of these there. Um, you can go to our website, foundrychurch.net, scroll down, find electronic copy, or if you live outside of West Michigan, I would love to send you a hard copy. Just send me an email uh, online at foundrychurch.net. I'll make sure that one gets shipped out to you. I also just want to say thank you for your generosity um, with the giving of your offerings in God's tithes. If you'd like to give to the Foundry, there's a few different ways you can do so. Um, you can go online to our website, foundrychurch.net, click the Give tab and follow the instructions. Or if you'd prefer, um, you can mail us your offering. Um, the address of our church is up on the screen right now. Boom! Three points. This week, Saturday, July 24, we're going to be having an event here at the Foundry Church. It's called Foundry Summer Nights. Um, it's going to be happening at 5.30. We're going to start serving food at 5.30 to 6.30. And then we're going to have carnival games at 6 o'clock. And um, we're going to have a bunch of outdoor games there, including cornhole. So we hope that you're able to make it this week, Saturday. Um, and it's just going to be a night to come together as a Foundry community and just to have a lot of fun with one another. So make sure you come out this week, Saturday, 5.30, uh, July 24. Um, we're looking forward to seeing you there and just looking forward for a fun night together. That's all the announcements we have this morning. I'll join me as we open in a word of prayer. Pray with me. Lord, I just thank you for this day. I thank you that we get to gather and we get to worship you. Um, Lord, we know that you are here with us um, no matter where we are worshiping this morning. And God, you are the king of creation. And uh, Lord, I just pray as we come together and worship and praise that we have come with open hearts just to receive the message that you have for us this morning. I pray that you'd please be with Pastor Eric as he gives the words. I pray that you wash over him with peace and may the words that he speaks, may they um, just be reflective of your gospel, Lord. Um, God, we're, we're excited for what you have in store for us today. And um, Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello and welcome to church. Whether this is your first time joining us or your 100th, we're so thankful that you came to worship with us today. Galatians 4, 6, and 7 is a great reminder that we have been freed from our old ways and brought into new life in Jesus. It says, because you are his children, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Let's sing praises to our God and King.
Friends, as we gather for communion tonight, um, we remember what it took for you and I to be called Christians. It's the broken body and the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're gathering with us on Monday night, Matt is going to explain to you how, um, how communion's gonna flow. If you're gathering with us at home, we're gonna give you just a moment's pause right now to go find a cracker and some juice or, uh, you know, I've seen great pictures back from our church of different things people had to take communion with. I don't know. Uh, if you can get as close to bread and juice as you can, that's great. I don't care if it's a wheat thin and a juice box. I think it's the heart and the spirit of coming to have remembrance, to have communion and hope. Because, friends, that's what this meal is built on. Communion remembrance, and hope. We come here today to remember that the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled all obedience to the divine law by his life, death, and um, obedience to God the Father in coming into this world, eventually to the, to the death on a cross, his obedience there to his heavenly Father. But in his life, death, and resurrection, and his ascension, he secured something for you and I. And what he secured is an eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation, whereby all of us are invited to come home to God in Christ. And none of us will be cast away if we come to Christ. We come here today to remember that this grace given to us was done so at the tremendous cost of the obedient Son of God to a death on a cross. We come here also to have communion, to have communion with this same Jesus who will not leave us, who said, I will be with you to the very end of the age. We come here to have communion with the Lord Jesus Christ because he promised that this is a place he will gather with his church. He will be with us in these moments. He, he promises that he is the eternal bread of heaven that strengthens us unto life eternal. And in the cup which we bless, he promises that he is the true vine in whom we must abide if we are to bear any fruit. Friends, we come here today to have communion with the risen Lord and communion with his broken body and shed blood in remembrance of the remission of our sins and the forgiveness of our sins. But we also come here today in hope. We come here today filled with hope, the hope that we are not left to be our best selves, but we can lay everything down at the cross and we can follow Jesus, not burdened by our sins and our natural sinful nature, but we can come and live supernaturally in the hope that Christ has sent his spirit. He's filling us and renewing us by the washing of the word and the moving of his spirit through our lives. We are being renewed and transformed into the image of him who we love, the Lord Jesus Christ. We come here today because there is hope in his broken body and shed blood. We come here today in hope because we know that we're not left alone to live this life, but we live this life as the body at the foundry, but also as the body ecumenically worldwide. There's billions of us who claim Jesus as Savior, who live in the everlasting hope of him as Savior. Praise God that we have the hope of this community where we stand together and worship and the global church where we all lift our voices and one day we'll gather with him at the marriage supper of the Lamb where we will see him with our faces unveiled and we will be made like him in his image. There is a hope in this meal that transcends the heartache of this life. Friends, I invite you today to a moment of remembrance, of communion, and of hope because there was a night when darkness hung like ink over paper and Jesus, knowing what was ahead of him, took the bread at the Last Supper and he broke it. And he said to his disciples, this is my body. And it's broken for you. As often as you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. And in the same manner also, the cup which he took, he blessed. And he said to them, this is the New Testament. It's written in my blood. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Friends, we come here tonight or today and we remember that we are people bought at a great price for the greatest of purposes, to be transformed into the image of him who we love. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we come to this meal, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus into this world. And Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you came and fulfilled all divine obedience 
even to that horrible death that we should have died. And Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are the great advocate, the counselor, the one who was sent to make all things clear about Jesus, to teach and instruct and glorify him. So come now and fill us, your church. God, if there is any um, sin in our lives, we take a moment now and we confess it. If we have any bitterness against someone else, God, we confess it. Forgive us for our sins and hear our confession as we spend a quiet moment laying before you the sin which we bear. Jesus' name. Amen. For the Monday nighters, Matt is going to come up and um, dismiss you to come get your elements. For those of you who are at home and worshiping with us, the body of Christ was broken for you, and the blood of Christ was shed for you. Take, eat, and drink. By the broken body and shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have been claimed. We are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Grace and peace to you, my friends, in being a new creation in Christ. It's Eric Zuber Incorporated. So you're sure that she's here somewhere in this park? Yes. I think she is alone. She said she'd be wearing a blue shirt. Okay. Um, I'll keep looking. So what's going on exactly? She is a friend of a friend. She's been on the same road over and over. The thing is, some people she met basically told her it was okay that she was broken. Which, which is true. Right. You know I know that. I was a disaster when I met Jesus. You know what happened. I had no one, no friends. Everyone stayed away from me. You can imagine being the woman with seven demons makes you pretty unapproachable. I'm, I'm sure it had to be awful. But Jesus healed me. He freed me. He's called me out of that life. This girl we're looking for, she's been told to share her brokenness, to be real but she hasn't been said anything to her about being free from it. They don't seem like they're really, you know, like true friends. No, she's been on the same broken path over and over. Uh, is, is that, that looks like her. And you know what, it doesn't look like she's doing okay. I know, just pull over, I will talk to her. If Jesus can make someone like me the first missionary, I can't imagine the joy that awaits this girl. It's okay, you can go, I've got this. Personality profiles. When I say personality profiles, um, hopefully you have like a fun image come to mind, right? The Enneagram, the, the Myers-Briggs, the one where you're like a lab or an otter or something like that. There's different ones, a line, something like that. Um, but I love how the, the, the new twist of social media has made it fun because you can like find out what Star Wars character you are. And it's always the worst when you're like, oh man, I'm quite gone, Jim. Like, nobody likes that, dude. Or you find out you're Spock, you're just a robot, and, and but who's not part of Star Wars, by the way. In case you're not a nerd and don't know that, don't ever act like Spock is part of Star Wars. He's a Trekkie. But anyways, you, you can find these out. You can find out what Harry Potter character you were. You can find out what member of the Office cast you were based on your personality profile. It's really kind of cool, and it's kind of fun to look into that. Um, so... 
uh, one time, well, we've done a few of these uh, personality profiles, and even in our family, we've done them, and there was, I believe, it's either Saddleback Church or, um, or North Point, where Andy Stanley's at. They, they did uh, one that was based on the colors, your certain colors, and your mixtures of colors, which I'm colorblind, so super fun. Um, but uh, I'll tell you this, one of our children was all one color. She had nothing, you now know who it is, she. It was Josh. Um, <laughs> no, it was Bella. Bella Boo was, um, she's all yellow. She's just this, this glowing extrovert, right? It, it's awesome. You see these things, and, um, and it's just fun to see who they are and see how it's true, right, in different ways. Um, but there is this thing I would like to talk about for a minute called Enneagram Entitlement. Now, entitlement is this, that you think that you are owed something by someone else, by just the sheer merit of who you are. Entitlement, I believe, is inherently negative. And I mean Enneagram entitlement in a negative sense. When we look at this is... Um, when you do the Enneagram, I am a seven with an eight wing, okay? And if I read that to you, actually, you know what? Let's have fun just for a minute. I'm going to read to you what a seven with an eight wing is. You're, you're going to be like, oh, you super duper are, Eric. Uh, we tend to identify most with the seven type, which is kind of bubbly outgoing type thing. But we share um, attributes with the eight type. They tend to be enthusiastic, determined, protective in their behavior. They're generally more tough and they work oriented than other seven types. And I'll be honest, like I, like I, I, I like to work. We, we get into it and we have a lot of fun. But there's this protective thing. The eight wing in me wants to control things and, um, and, and it can work really negatively in some ways. But I, I know who I am on the Enneagram and I look at that and I can see what's going on. They're supposed to help me communicate and understand some of the ways I talk to people hurt others and things like that, right? They, or, or maybe I'm a little too forceful. Uh, maybe I'm a little too protective and people need to spread their wings to which my kid's probably like, yeah, super duper dad. But that's the way it is. There's a little bit of me, but it's not an excuse for me. It's, a, it's supposed to be a tool that helps me function better to work well together, to know how maybe someone else feels when I'm talking to them and hear them and hear uh, maybe a little of what's between what's being said, right? Between the lines. Get some of the personality traits to help us communicate. And, um, and here's what the problem is. A lot of what's going on with the Enneagram entitlement is this, um, it's an obsession, it's an obsession, and I know a lot of pastors who are super into this stuff, and what I believe is it becomes a self-obsessed, self-focused, false sense of confidence in your nature, in your identity. It's a false bag of gospel garbage. It's not the good news, it's the good news about you. And, and we get into this, and, and we've, we, we kind of use it, again, Tiny Tim, we got this little crutch. I'm a seven with an eight wing, so I'm going to be protective and controlling. Eh, not the best. Not the best. I, I, it's good to be protective, but that controlling aspect, how do, you, how do you trust people into God's care and into their own decisions? When we look at it, we know that I could say, well, I'm going to be overprotective. I'm a seven with an eight wing. That's just what I am. I'm gonna be hard driving. And it can be our, na our badge um, of our natural nature. This is who I am, this is how God made me. Doesn't God love me the way he made me? But I will tell you this, Christ called us to transformation into his nature, not into your best nature. Your best nature and my best nature is sinful at best. We are sinful by nature, so what we need is to be transformed, not into our best self, but into the very image of Jesus Christ, which is a thoroughly spiritual thing. It's God doing the work deep inside us by his spirit and the washing of the word. So we look at this, and I do know this, that you and I are going to struggle to let go of the idea that we can become our best selves, and that's enough for God. The only thing we can be is dependent on Jesus Christ. So 
when it comes to Enneagram, I was looking and I couldn't find the number that lines up for us for demon possession. I was like, what is that? Is that like a nine with a two wing? What is it? You don't know. Well, there's not actually an Enneagram for that, but there's a story in the Bible of a woman named Mary, and I'm gonna invite you to join me. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter eight, verse one to three, it says this. After this, Jesus traveled um, about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him. The 12 were with him. And some women who have been cured of evil spirits and disease. So there's women traveling with him who had been cured of diseases, and they were possessed by evil spirits. Mary, called Magdalene, she was from the town of Magdala, um, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support the ministry of Jesus out of their own funds. So they were giving. But did you catch that? Mary Magdalene had seven demons living in her person. She was possessed. And when Mary met Jesus, she needed this intersection. This intersection in her life was... um, where Christ found her at her very worst. And one of the things we deceive ourselves into is that her worst is worse than your worst. But the reality is because we're sinful in nature, we all meet Jesus Christ at our worst. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And any sin separates us from God. So we recognize that her worst, she met Jesus. And here is what scares me the most about this story. 15 years ago, in our cultural context, I believe I could have said, there's a woman in the story, in the story of Jesus in the Gospels, named Mary Magdalene, who was possessed by seven demons. And the the response I would have gotten was sympathy and sorrow and hope that Jesus healed her. Hope that he healed her and a longing to see what happened in her life. But here's what scares me nowadays, church. What scares me nowadays is I feel like instead of sympathy, I think if I told people about a girl possessed by demons, they might be like, oh, cool, wow. How'd she get in touch with her spiritual side? There's this attraction to the mysterious and the spiritual and the ethereal in our culture. Or they'd be like, I'd love to hear about her struggle. Right? It sounds so noble. I'd like to hear about how she, you know, how she dealt with that. I'd like to hear about her story. I'd like to hear what was going on in here. Um, Many today would say it this way. um, Well, that's just the way I am. It's just the way I am. It's the way God made me. And, And go on to talk about um, how their story is, is so obsessed with their brokenness and they fixate on their brokenness and they go on um, and, and they have these, these moments where they're influencers in our culture. They become influencers and they're on different talk shows and different podcasts and they're making their story known and they're telling the story of their brokenness. That's just the way I am. Mary's intersection meets Jesus just the way she is. But I want to tell you something. That struggle, that struggle she was in is not the glory of this story. When I hear this is just who I am, who I am, it becomes this like, um, poisonous lie of Satan in our culture. That's just who I am. That's just the way God made me. And I hear people saying it and getting a free pass on it and everything from spirituality and the occult to warped sexuality to abusive behaviors to addictive behaviors. Sorry, it's just the way I am. It's just the way I am. It's an entitlement to who you are. But Jesus didn't come and say, hey, just the way you are, that's what I want you to remain No, he loves you just the way you are and his desire is to redeem you into the fullness of who he is. So when we look at this, we understand that we as Christians have missed the point on this one. We have missed the opportunity to speak truth as a church we, we started out, I would say, um, in my childhood, in my younger years, the church um, called brokenness unacceptable. They shunned broken people, I feel like. Broken people weren't allowed. If you had something that had happened in your past, a divorce, or you made a mistake, you know, or, or, or you struggled with addiction, or you had these things, the church shunned you. 
And I think that, that is a real problem, pushing broken people out. We had to clean up before we could meet Jesus. That is so out of line with Scripture. You do not have to clean up before you meet Jesus. We didn't love sinners. We didn't talk about hurt and loss and things the way we needed to. We needed to be able to hear what had happened in people's lives and hear them and let them repent and let them confess. We hid depression, anxiety, abuse, and sexual sin because we had to look like something and we did so at the expense of our inside, of our spirit. We looked good on the outside, but inside we were dead. And Jesus said this of the Pharisees, you're like whitewashed tombs, you're painted nice on the outside. Inside you are full of dead man's bones. So we look at this and understand that that was where the pendulum was. But now it's swinging a different direction. The pendulum has swung all the way to the other side. Now, we don't just um, talk about brokenness, which I think is good. To name brokenness, it's so good. That's my eight wing on Enneagram, like straight talk. That is super duper part of me. Like, that's it. I think that's important. But the pendulum swung past straight talk And all the way to this thing where it's like, nope, now we embrace it. Now we embrace it. That's just who you are, girl. Right? I'm like, ah, drives me nuts. It's wrong. It's not biblical. Have you said these things before? Let's just go through a quick list of these things. Um, uh, That's just me. I'm a worrier. Right? Um, I'm just an anxious person. I can't help it. I was born this way. I can't help it. It's just who I am. Right? Right? Um, I just like to tell it like it is. Sorry. The whole sorry, not sorry thing. Ooh, man, I'd love to play hockey with them, and I can't skate. Like, I just, that gets to me. You know, the sorry, not sorry mentality. I'm in a mood today, so people better deal with it. Oh, right? I mean, I, I, again, Enneagram, I can be moody, but the reality is um, the best part of me is some of my, my friendships, my relationships, especially my wife will be like, don't act like that. And I'm like, yeah, you're probably right. Like, it's not my favorite, but I love being pushed out of that and not letting that be indulged. I will tell you this, there are books out there today that want you to name and claim things that God doesn't have for you. I mean, I, I really struggle. I really struggle. Like, and I'll just use probably the easiest example is like the prayer of Jabez. Oh, Lord, enlarge my tent. Give me more, right? We pray these things, and we want more, more, more from God. We don't want more of God. We want more stuff from God. God, the divine vending machine. Um, the new kind of, the blush on it now is, is, you know, girl, wash your face, that book. Oh, like I'm, I read an article called Girl, Follow Jesus, because it's not about reminding yourself of your goals and being your best self. I mean, Joel Olstein has done a disservice to the gospel of Jesus Christ in saying your best life now. I will tell you this, your best life will be when you stay stand before Jesus Christ. That's the fullness of who we are, and this life isn't what it's about. We are called to be a living sacrifice, broken bread, and poured out wine for the one whom we confess. We look at this and understand that sorry, not sorry, has become in some way the anthem of our culture. We've swung in the extremes of doing nothing about it and saying nothing to embracing it as though it's noble and we need to find center. It's okay not to be okay. It's just not okay to stay there. That's what Matt Chandler said. I love Chandler. He yells a lot. If you ever think I'm a little spunky when I preach, you ought to listen to Matt Chandler at the Village Church. You'll be like, you know what, Pastor Eric is a sweet man. I love Chandler because he gets after it. But he says this. It's okay not to be okay. It's just not okay to stay there. And it's one of the reasons we have the value in this church of transformation. You are not here to be your best self. You are here to be remade by the Spirit of God into the image of Jesus Christ. We are to be the bride of Christ. We are to reflect him in every possible way, to be transformed. Staying not okay is not the right choice. It means that you may have had an intersection with Jesus and realized there's sin in your life. 
realize there's brokenness. But to take that brokenness and be like, I'm going to make a quilt and wear it all the time out of it, that is a brokenness. You don't want to clothe your life in your story. You want to clothe your life in his story. He calls us forward and upward out of our former self and into him. So this calling is transformational. Let's look at Mary. Mary, Mary Magdalene. Let's take a look at her. John 19, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, Mary, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of uh, Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, the woman who had seven demons in her. The crowds were gone. All the disciples had fled. All that was left was three women, one disciple, and the Roman centurions. Even the priests had walked away. And there hung our dead Savior on a cross, bearing the sin of the world. And Mary Magdalene stood there before him. She stood there before him, fearless in the face of the onslaught, traumatized by the death of the Lord she loved. Why? Because she had been transformed. She loved him. She followed him. And she would follow him into the darkest place. And right now, that was his death. And there she stood. But maybe you don't identify with Mary Magdalene. Maybe you haven't been possessed. My hope would be that. Maybe you're like another Mary that shows up in Scripture. Mary from a town of Bethany, who is the sister of Lazarus, who has had an intersection with Jesus Christ, and her intersection with Jesus Christ um, was, was this wonderful moment where Jesus had come and raised her brother from the dead. And he had taught and he had elevated Mary and said, no, sit and listen to me teach. And she had laid herself before Christ and and she would serve him and follow him. And it says this in John chapter 12, verses one to eight, it says this, the gospel of John. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived. I love that, where Lazarus lived, not where Lazarus died. He had been raised at this point. Whom? It says Jesus is raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, which is a whole other story on that, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard. It's an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Have you ever walked into Bath and Body Works at Christmas and you're like, oh, I have a migraine? Because it's so overwhelming, right? It smells somewhere between a pine tree and a cranberry blossom, and you're just overwhelmed. You know, you throw in a hint of vanilla and you're like, wow, it is Christmas in my nose right now. It's overwhelming. That's what it is. It was actually just an overwhelming sense of this aroma that was in the room. But One of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a whole year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but he said it because he cared it. He was a thief and he cared about himself. As a keeper of the money bag, he used to, he used to help himself uh, with what was put into it. So leave her alone are the words of Jesus. Jesus says, leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. He's saying she did the best thing with it. She gave the best thing to me. You have something in common with her. And I love this aspect of the story because the same story is told in the gospel of Mark. In Mark chapter 14, Jesus says this of Mary and the sacrifice of her gift. Truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. It was a costly gift. It cost her everything. It would have been an inheritance-worthy gift. It was a year's worth of wages. And here's the thing. What she did has something in common with Mary Magdalene. It has this, this thing of women with two different stories 
Two different stories, but one similar thing. They intersected Jesus Christ. They came from different backgrounds. They were different people, different personalities. But suddenly, the advent of Christ in their life transformed them. Something happened in them. They met Jesus, and in meeting Jesus, they didn't want to be their best selves. They wanted to be like him. They wanted to be close to him. And I think there is some... some some cultural knowledge in this. In this day and age, women would take on the very identity of their husband. They would cleave to their husband and he would be their support, their sustenance, and their identity. And I know that goes against the woman's lib movement, but we as the church, male and female, are called to be the bride of Christ. We are called to cleave deeply into him and hold on to Jesus Christ. Not hold on to our best self and see what we bring to the table, but to grab onto him who is our everything. He is our source and our sustenance. That's what we have in common here. It's not our backgrounds. Life isn't fair. Some are wealthy, some are poor, some are pretty, some are not, some are successful, some struggle. But here's the thing. All of us meet Jesus on the same ground, sinners in need of salvation, and we cleave to him to be transformed into his image. That's what they had in common. They had both been made new in and by Christ. What a wonderful hope there is for us. It didn't matter how they started. It mattered who they grabbed on to. Jesus is where everything changed for them. They left their old life, their old patterns. One of them was a demon-possessed woman. Seemed pretty natural to leave that. It seems like Mary was a little more normal, just a Jewish girl, but she left it all behind and ran to Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the old creation, the new creation has come, and the old is gone. The new is here. The new has come. The old is gone. Because the new is here. Because the new is here. Something new and wonderful is here. So hear me when I say this. It's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to stay there. I don't want the best you. The best you can do nothing of value for the kingdom of God. But the you who has given fully to Christ and follows his will and his desire, you can change the world. It's okay not to be okay. It's just not okay to stay there. And there are biblical um, characters, human beings who lived in the biblical um, story. King David, he's one of these people who can, we can say it was okay not to be okay. King Davis was anxious and he was desperate at times. He was anxious and desperate. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and the garden of Gethsemane. The woman at the well had gone through five husbands, countless partners in life. She was an emotional wreck. She was an emotional wreck. Saul was a murderer. Not King Saul, Saul who became the Apostle Paul. So it's okay not to be okay. Look at where they met Jesus. But it's not okay to stay there. It's not okay to stay there. David asked God, search my heart and see if there is any anxious way in me. Search my heart, God. It's not like, hey God, I've noticed I'm anxious. Any way you want to use that this month, I'm going to play my harp. No. No, God was not into the indie album of David. He was into the Psalm David who cried out to God and said, if there's any anxiety in me, find it, root it out. I want to be confident in you. David knew his own shortcomings. He didn't want it, and he invited God to work. Jesus relied on Scripture, Deuteronomy 6 and 8, in his temptation. He quoted it back, and he asked for prayer, and he he asked his disciples, pray with me. When he's in the garden, he was desperate. Pray with me, he asked. And he said, not my will, God, but yours be done to his heavenly Father. Jesus was tempted, and he turned back to the Word, and he turned to his Father, and he turned to his community. That's where he turned. The woman at the well left her sinful life. It didn't say, and after this she had five more husbands. No, that's not what it says. It says that she left her sinful life and went and told the story of Jesus. It's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to stay there. You can heal. You can take time. But you need to get back into the transformation. Saul received Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. 
He was blind, then he was blinded by God, then he was healed, and he went on to write two thirds of the New Testament. Two thirds of the New Testament is written by a murderous man who hated the church until he met its founder, Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful story of it's, not, it's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to stay there. Thank God they didn't stay in their brokenness. Thank God they didn't stay there. Jesus doesn't endorse our brokenness. He calls us out of it. Jesus isn't here to be like, oh yeah, you're super broken. No, he knows. And he is gracious and he has compassion and he loves you. But here's the thing. He doesn't want to leave you in that mud puddle. He wants to pick you up, clean you off, and transform you into the image he made you in. Never forget how crafty the enemy of our soul is. The enemy of our soul will literally put lipstick on those ugly things. Be like, look how pretty it is, your brokenness. Tell that story. Tell that story. Tell everybody how wounded you are, but how you set goals and you have dreams and you'll do great things. No, that's not the gospel. The gospel is this. Tell Jesus how broken you are and invite him to redeem all that's lost and use you according to his purposes. We talk about these heroes of the faith, but understand this, just because they met Jesus doesn't mean everything got instantly better. I mean, Paul was shipwrecked and all that. We'll talk about him later in this series. Things can be tough, but in the midst of the hard things, in the midst of the transformation, there is a peace that passes understanding, and you can't find that peace in you. You can only find it in Jesus Christ. That peace exists only in Christ. It's okay to struggle, but it's not okay to build your life around the struggle. The enemy will say, yeah, yeah, you, you struggle. That's, that's who you are. It's okay. Lots of people struggle with this. Join the crowd. Let's all be different together, right? That's what happens. We get to these points where it's just, it's exhausting to watch people build up their, their character around their brokenness, and you're going, Why? Why do we have to embrace and celebrate that which Christ died to redeem and restore? Church, we look at this and we know that when Satan says it's just who you are, let that be like a smoke alarm in your life. It's not who you are if you're in Christ. That's a lie. For as it said in Corinthians, the new has come and the old is gone. For all who are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. You are not that anymore. You may struggle with it. It may want to bind you, but I will tell you this. Your nature is now rooted in Christ. Your identity is rooted in Jesus Christ. And the, the, the thing that Satan will want to do is he'll want to make us more and more natural human. I just want to be a good human. I see those bumper stickers, right? I think it was in Sedona, Arizona the other day. Be a good human. I'm like... I have to preach this sermon in like a week. You know, I say, be a good human. I'm, there really aren't many good humans. And I'm talking to you and me. Just not really good humans. We have great intentions, but intentions never did much. Don't be a good human. Love Jesus and become like him. Become like Christ. Become like him. This is not what Jesus says to say, be a good human. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Rest from what? From your broken, sinful baggage. He will carry for you what you could never bear. He will bridge the gap between heaven and hell for you. He's done it for you, not to be your best self, but to be remade in his image. He offers you forgiveness and he helps you embrace the fact that yes, you are forgiven. And yes, you were willfully sinful. And yes, you were really broken. And yes, you left a trail of destruction. But yes, it's all under the blood of Christ. And there may be consequences from our sin, but we are no longer bound to repeat those patterns. We are called into a new nature, a supernatural life. You don't have to stay there. You can live life in his power. And he is with you, he promised. I am with you now until the very end of the age. We said it in the communion liturgy because it matters. He is with us now until the very end of the age. He will never leave us and he will never forsake us. The follow me of Jesus Christ is an invitation to leave behind you. I think of like um, an old car in like the movie Cars, you know the cartoon, and one of the rusty cars and as it clunks down the road like parts are falling off. That's how I see our life, just parts falling off. 
And there's a trail behind us of us being left behind and being remade into his image. Remade into his image. The follow me of Jesus is not a call to a natural self-help. It is called to a, it's a calling to a supernatural. Something beyond what this world can offer. A supernatural transformation of who you are at the core. It's a call to be made into the image of him who we confess who we trust, and who we profess into the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who will reign both now and forever. Amen. It's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to stay there. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word and for the way it speaks. Thank you for Mary, both of them, for their lives that they led and the way that um, you called them out of their lives and into yourself. So even now, we pray, God, come into our lives. And show us what is to remain behind as we, as we courageously follow you forward in the follow me of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we follow you, Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this all in your name. Amen and amen. In Genesis 1 verse 27, it talks about how God created man and woman in his image. It means he created you and he created me in his image. And if we keep reading, we find out how Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and it welcomed sin into this world, sin and brokenness. But that's not the end, because God sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross to save us from our sins, to set us free from our sins. And we have a phrase here at the Foundry, it's, it's, it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay there. Which that means is it's okay to have problems, to struggles, to have brokenness, we all have it. We're all going to sin. We're broken and we're human. But it's not okay to stay in that place. God calls us out of those places, just like Mary Magdalene and how she was possessed by demons. But God healed her and she was freed from those things. And he can do the same for you. So this morning, I just want to encourage you to take some time this week to pray and to ask God to convict you of any sin that you're living in that it's not okay to stay in. And then to ask him to show you what steps you need to take to get out of that. Maybe, he's, maybe it's bringing friends around you to pray with you, to encourage you. Maybe it's spending time with the Lord and just laying it down time and time again and asking him to fill you and give you strength to put it behind you. It's okay to work through those things, but we can't stay there. We're called to be transformed and made into Christ's image, for we were created in his image. So as you go from here, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you would like prayer this morning or you have a prayer request, you can reach out to our prayer team. Uh, just text the keyword of Foundry online to 94000 and press the number three key. Other than that, I hope you enjoy this day. We're right in the middle of summer, so get outside, enjoy it, and we look forward to worshiping with you again next week and seeing you this coming Saturday at Summer Nights event.